in this series recommend that people bring a Haggadah and any standard Haggadah, including a Maxwell House Haggadah, will suffice as long as it's a, a, a you know, a, has the version, the authentic version of the Haggadah. You will notice that the Haggadahs of Klal Yisrael are essentially all the same. There's only a few nuances in the Haggadahs. The reason being we have a Kabbalah that the Haggadah was written by Elio Anovi. That the Bala Haggadah is Elijah the Prophet himself. And that's why that there's such a similarity within the Haggadahs and Klal Yisrael. And you see that we don't miss a beat. Comes Motsi Purim and we're already Pesadik. Uh, besides the fact that uh, my wife and I are uh, insanely eliminating all the Mishloch, Manas, and Chametz from the house. At this point, all the women are like, you know, we are, we are way overdue for Pesach cleaning. And most people think, 30 days? It's, no, no, no. 30 days is, it's already like crunch time once you're 30 days till Pesach. Nobody cleans the house like they didn't do for Pesach. So already this feeling of Pesach is in the air. And we want to get in to the Haggadah together. The Haggadah is essentially what we're going to be using for Leila Seder, for the Passover Seder. And it's actually not that long. It's actually very short, but it's all the commentaries that make them very fat. I think there's more Haggadahs than any other safer printed. Everybody has their own Haggadah. Everyone has their own version of the Haggadah. And you should just pick one that uh, you feel connected to. And if you're going to be using it though, for the Seder, I recommend keeping it in a bag or something to prevent it from getting chametz. Because there is something nice about preparing your Haggadah 30 days before Pesach, writing in notes in the Haggadah, in concepts, ideas, and being able to have that at the Seder. At the Seder itself, it's not about complicated Torah. The Seder is about saying over the story. Saying over the Sipur of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim in the clearest language possible that you can muster up. But the first step and the first question we want to ask is, so Leila Seder is about leaving Mitzrayim. And we have to remember that we are slaves to Par Mitzrayim. And we have to say that, the Sipur of leaving Mitzrayim. And the question is, what does that have to do with me? You know, me? You know how long ago that was? How long ago did we leave Mitzrayim? Yeah. 3,300 plus years ago. It's been, it's been a while. And we're still holding on to this story. We're so much sugar about Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We seem to be talking about it all the time. You make Kiddush? Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Mezuzahs? Tefillin? Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. You redeem your firstborn son? Your firstborn donkey? Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Shema? Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So everything, so all the, the Gimur Regalim, Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We're all the time, the Shugana, and then forget Pesach, Zeich Yitzhak Mitzrayim. The whole of Jewish life seems to be centered around this, this mentality, what you might even call a slave mentality of, of this post-traumatic stress disorder that's still going on millennia later in our people of this leaving Mitzrayim, the pains that we went through in Mitzrayim and the leaving of Mitzrayim. Is this something that, that there was still healing a very old wound? And we have to recount the story so many millennia later. Is that what this is all about? That would seem very, very unapplicable to me. And everyone has to ask themselves that question is, what does leaving Egypt 3,300 plus years ago have to do with me today in 2021? With all the things going on in my life, what's the relevance of leaving Mitzrayim? If we don't ask ourselves that question, then we can go into Pesach just kind of like, okay, I'll just go through the motions of Pesach and not really ask the question of what does it have to do with me now? I want to 
point to something we say in the Haggadah, which is Bechol Dar Vador, Chayv Odom Lirai says, Atzma Ki Hilu Hu Yotzu Mitzrayim. We're going to read in the Haggadah that in every generation you have to see yourself as if you are leaving Egypt. Which means, it's not that one time we left, it's that in every generation we are leaving Egypt. Not this is something that we're recounting, this is not a, a commemoration, this is not a 4th of July celebration of something that one time happened. And the language of the Balatanya in the Tanya Perak Mem Zayn takes it one step further. Hide bechol dor vador, in every generation, vechol yoim vayoim, in every day. Chayv odom lirais atzma ki ilu hu yotza hayoim. You have to see yourselves today like you left Mitzrayim. I don't know about you, but uh, Sasha, when was the last time you visited Egypt? Probably not so recently. So, how do we? Also considering that the Rambam Paskins that a Jew is not allowed to go back there. There's a question if that means you're not allowed to go live there or you can't even visit. The Rambam. So there he had to go. But that a Jew should go back to Mitzrayim if he doesn't have to. It says in the Gemara that would when we came out of Mitzrayim, this is more of a Kabbalistic idea, it was Kemetsulois She'en Boidagin. We, we basically took a net. When we have to go to different places, you guys ever wonder why you had to get on the J train and you by accident got on the I train and then you made it somewhere and then you got late to your meeting and then you met that person and something happened and even if nothing in a revealed sense and then you went and you had to like use uh, some public toilet somewhere and then you and then you made an Asher Yotza in some weird place, and then all these things happen. So the answer is, we don't have time to fully develop this now, but there's something called sparks of God, Nitzaitzis, which mean that Hashem is wanting to be revealed in different places, and we don't always know why Hashem has these pockets of godliness in different places. They got scattered at the time of creation. Shir Sekelem and Adam made more scattering after the Chayt. But for all generations, part of why we were dispersed to the four corners of the globe is we have to go pick up these sparks. Okay? You didn't realize when you got on that wrong train, it, was, it wasn't the wrong train at all. You had to go to a certain place to gather something. Some to reveal Hashem in some place. And many of the righteous tzaddikim would go on these walks in the forest because they knew that they had to go to certain places and gather these sparks up. But it says about Egypt that when we left, we took out all of the sparks. The sparks are represented by all the wealth that we took out. When it says that we left, you know we had a lot of money when we left. First of all, they owed us 210 years of wages that they withheld. So we made good on the deal. You know, gold is expensive. And we had a lot of it. We had you know, hundreds of donkeys, each laden with gold. That's even more than Bitcoin. That's a lot. We're talking. And then we got even more than that at Biza Sayyam, when all the wealth washed up onto the shores of the Mitzrim, of the Yamsuf, we had that doesn't just mean we had gold, it means we took out God's sparks. We were like, it was a fish net that we pulled all the fish out that's hinting to get the sparks. So that's what it means that you can't go back to Egypt, there's no more sparks there to pick up. We hollowed them all out. So the question is even stronger now. Why are we so obsessed with this concept of leaving Egypt? It seems that we were never even there, it seems that there's nothing for us there. It's something that happened thousands of years ago. So why is this maybe the biggest holiday? And in a certain way, it's the most Jewish holiday there is. 
no matter how much affiliation or non-affiliation you have, reform, conservative, reconstructionist, etc. Everybody has some type of a Passover seder. Everybody. It's something that everybody knows is fundamental to our belief. But it seems that out of anything, it's the most abstract. Who's been in Egypt? What are we talking about Egypt? Pharaoh? I went to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. They're dead. They're mummified. It's a pretty impressive museum. It's just to see the massive tombs and the massive mummies. It's a spooky place. But what does that have to do with me now? Where is Pharaoh? Where is the ancient Egyptian culture? And why do we seem to have the Baal Haggadah telling us that the Kol Dor Vador, we're going to read this in your Haggadah. Every single generation, a person has to see himself like he left Egypt. And the Balatanya says every single day. And the Shulchan Aruch Arav, also the Balatanya, points out in the Halachas of Pesach, the Kol Rega Verega, every second, like you came out of Mitzrayim. How do we do that? There's not even flights from, you know, the skies are closed. How, do, how are we getting out of Egypt? So today is going to be the day of introduction. And if once you can really appreciate what we're about to say now, this will create a framework for our entire way of looking at the Haggadah with new eyes entirely. So what we're about to mention now will be the theme, the thread, the golden cord running through the entire understanding of the Haggadah, which is the Svarim point out that Mitzrayim is not only a place called the land of Egypt, which has borders from the Mediterranean to the Sinai to, uh, to, into, into Africa, etc. Mitzrayim is a concept which comes from the word, you might have heard this before, Meitzarim. Meitzarim means narrow, constricted places. Those places that are very tight. Mina Meitzar, Karasika. It's, it's tight, it's, it's, I'm choked. Meitzarim is like, you're, 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 you're claustrophobic and choked. You're held back. You're not open and free. You're constricted. Every single time the Torah talks about leaving Mitzrayim, it doesn't mean that you should remember that you left the land of Egypt. That's just the very basic meaning. Yes, we did leave a place called Egypt, and Pharaoh was a man who thought he was a god and pretended to not have to use the bathroom, and then Moshe caught him with his pants down. And that was embarrassing for him. But Mitzrayim means through all the generations, there's going to be an energy inside of you, inside of your psyche called Mitzrayim that is choking you, that is strangling your potential, that is constricting everything that you could be, that is holding you down. And there's a voice of Paroi, Paro is the same letters as Pe-Ra, the evil mouth, evil speech, that is holding you down and constricting everything that you could and should be. That energy of Mitzrayim, of Meitzarim, is something that we are affected by in every generation, in every single day, every single moment, that there's an energy that's holding us back from being the greatest people that we could be. Essentially, preventing our neshamas from bursting out and becoming massive people. The journey through the Haggadah is a journey of feeling constricted and actually feeling all of the 
chokingness of all of our bad habits, all of our negative self-talk, all of our negative psyche self-image and transitioning through the night of Pesach to the point that we leave as free people, essentially revealing the neshama, cracking away the mate sarim, the limiting psyche that's on top of us, totally bursting out of that consciousness and having total consciousness with the soul. The soul is the opposite of Mitzrayim. The soul essentially is the part of Moshe that's inside of you. Moshe represents your soul. That Moshe is the one that is coming and rescuing from Parai, from the evil shell of your psyche, negative self-talk, the power inside of you. So Mitzrayim is no longer a place, uh, you know, to the, to the southwest of us. And there it is. Mitzrayim is something happening inside of me. And Mitzrayim is something that is relevant in every single generation, every single day. And to the degree that I'm able to go through this properly, you will be able to crack away another layer of the Pharaoh that is covering a person. Let's just take this one step deeper. Whoever has been with us in the Tanya Shi'urim will know that we speak a lot about the two souls that you have. You have a godly soul. Your godly soul only wants meaning, purpose. The godly soul is what we call a chelak elakai mi mal mamish, an undiluted consciousness of God. And you have an animal soul, which is selfish, interested in self not interested in anything more, and is essentially that which is holding you back, but convinces you that it's what you really want. For example, the animal soul will tell you, you should get angry at that person. Even though you're not gonna make anything on the deal, if you were just to take a video of yourself getting angry, you'd be appalled. That's one of the best ways I hear from the Rashiva Shlita. He says one of the best ways to stop yourself from getting angry is have somebody just you know, videotape you, as you're getting angry, or just, you know, have them be paparazzi. From, from, and then he'll play you back the incident of you getting angry, and you'll, oh, ah, oh, oh, horrible. Because you see, it's like, who was that? That is the classic animal soul at work. Being impatient. You're not gonna get there any faster. You just make yourself look like a fool. It's, but it's so classic, the guy's like, eh, eh. Road rage is the most illogical thing. <laughs> but somehow, you're standing in line, you're fidgeting, the bank, and your breath starts getting all, it's not gonna make it go any faster, and people are getting upset at you, but somehow the animal soul convinces you that that's just how you should respond. The animal soul makes you chase after all sorts of pursuits that won't help you, not in this world, not in the world to come. But it will convince you that that's what you want. But sadly, people actually get convinced that that is what they want. The allure of the animal soul. The head consciousness of the animal soul has a name. His name is Paro. And I'm sad to say, but four-fifths of the Jewish people felt that it would be better to stay in Egypt. Because, you know, Pharaoh's giving us, you know, this is what I know. Not only the slave mentality of the sick reality that women who are beaten by their husbands somehow can't get away from it because that's what they know and they see as a sign of love and they just, not only that, that the slave mentality of Egypt, 
but we didn't know that there was some other alternative. We didn't know that there was a part inside of us that says in Ishbitz that we think that Egypt had like these big barbed wire fences. And there was you know, people with you know, air rifles that would shoot anybody that would try to escape. It says in Ishbitz, Egypt didn't have any barbed wire fences. There was no guards, there was no rifles, there was no Dobermans. You could leave anytime you wanted. But nobody thought that they could ever leave. How could I have... I, I'm constricted, that's all I know. All I know is this is my thing. I have bricks today, I'm gonna get whipped if I don't do the bricks, but is something else? What did Moshe do? What was Moshe, who's your godly soul? I mean, this whole story is happening inside of you. What is Moshe, what's his voice? He comes to Paro. Moshe is very smart. What does he say to Paro? Give them a day off. Not because of any spiritual reason, because if you don't, your workers are going to die. So Paro says, Taka. Good idea, Moshe. They'll be more productive. What was Moshe's real intention? Well, give them a day off. You know what day he gave them? Shabbos. What will they do? The Jews in Egypt will actually start thinking about God. They have space to actually see that there's something beyond my slave mentality. My rat race mentality. A guy could never go to Mitzrayim, but he gets on the J train, the I train, every single day of his life. He never knew there's something more. He's sunk in Egypt. He's sunk in Mitzrayim. A guy could also go on the J train, the I train, and be totally a free man. It all depends on who's stepping onto the train. Is Pharaoh putting him on the train? This is what you know. Stay with what you know. Don't go outside your, con your confines. Or is Moshe putting him on the train? The voice of consciousness, the voice of your neshama. A Jew, and really all of humanity, that's why so much of humanity feels connected to the idea of leaving Egypt, is stuck in Pharaoh consciousness. And he's the taskmaster who's guiding your life. The real story, the Haggadah, and this is just the beginning, I want you to keep this consciousness in mind as we go through the Haggadah together, is going to be the journey of recognizing the slavery of the Pharaoh inside of you, the Pera, and the transition of cracking away that serpentine, that serpentile, snake-like, by the way, the Pharaohs had these big snakes over there. It wasn't for naught that they were very, that's the Nochash. That's the snake of Gan Eden. The Moshe is the one that's able to crack away that consciousness and allow the soul to shine out. That is the purpose of Passover. To be Zoycher Aboisai, to be continued tomorrow. Yeshua have a wonderful day. Call to. Thank you.